Sometimes archaeology can be disturbing. Get ready to learn about freaky artifacts and haunting historical discoveries like creepy crypts full of human hearts and Blackbeard's disturbing treasure, the Imperial Crypt of the Habsburgs. From the 15th century until the 18th century, the Habsburg family ruled a massive part of Europe. The family only met their end in World War I. It was partly from the war and partly because they were so inbred, they could no longer have kids. The ancient dynasty still lives on, though. Welcome to the terrifying imperial crypt of the Habsburgs. The imperial crypt is in the city of Vienna. Within its creepy catacombs are the remains of 12 emperors, 18 empresses, and 113 other family members. There are 105 metal sarcophagi. The most impressive of all the coffins is the double sarcophagus containing the remains of Emperor Franz Stefan and Empress Maria Theresa. The old crypt contains more than just the boxes holding the bodies of Europe's most famous dynasty. There are also 55 hearts contained in special urns within a chamber known as the Heart Room. In the St. George's Chapel, just a few blocks away from the main crypt, you can find the embalmed entrails of royal family members as well. Why did the emperors and their families feel it necessary to preserve their hearts and entrails? Well, death in the Habsburg family was a big affair. Every time one of the main family members died, usually a monarch, there was a massive funeral held. Death meant the creation of an elaborate sarcophagus and matching reliquaries to hold their internal organs. The body would be put in one crypt, the heart in another, and the entrails in a third. It was all just part of the inbred family's tradition. Think of it as a way to grasp at immortality, just like what the ancient Egyptians did with their canopic jars and complex burial rituals, the last lifeboat of the Titanic. On May 13, 1912, three haunting photographs were taken. They are some of the most disheartening pictures that have to do with the tragedy of the Titanic. The pictures were taken a month after the Titanic sank. One photo shows crew members from the RMS Oceanic trying to recover a lifeboat that was found floating aimlessly in the sea. The second picture shows the boat approaching the listless lifeboat. The third picture is of two crew members of the Oceanic on the lost Titanic lifeboat. The reason these pictures are so horrifying is that this was the last lifeboat from the Titanic to be found. When it was discovered, there were three decomposing bodies inside. The only record of the disturbing discovery is a handwritten account by an unidentified passenger on the RMS Oceanic. The handwritten notes and the ghoulish pictures detail exactly what happened that day over a century ago. One of the corpses was found wearing a dinner jacket. The other two bodies were a fireman on the Titanic. The fireman's bodies had been wedged underneath the seats of the lifeboat. When an officer from the Oceanic tried to remove the first body, he pulled on its arm and the arm came right off. Just imagine for a second how truly traumatic that would be. First you found the bodies, then when you tried to get them off the boat you accidentally ripped one of their arms off. But what's the story behind the passengers? It's believed they were already dead on the night that the Titanic sank. Survivors filled the lifeboat but not all of them made it long enough to be rescued. Some were saved and the rest were abandoned in the lifeboat. Then the lifeboat drifted for a month before it was finally found. The man in the dinner jacket was identified as Thomas Beatty. A wedding ring discovered in the lifeboat was found to belong to a Swedish passenger named Ellen Gerda Lindel. Ellen had initially reached the lifeboat but drowned in the confusion. Her ring got lost on the lifeboat. Her husband, Edvard Lindel, was never found. The three photographs and a handwritten note describing the horrors of the discovery were recently sold at an auction in the UK. The artifact at a pre-sale estimate of only about $4,000, the Jolly Roger. There was nothing more terrifying to a sailor in the 18th century than seeing a Jolly Roger appear in the distance. One of the most terror-inspiring pirate flags ever was put on display at a museum in Portsmouth. It might just be the best example of a real pirate flag with the skull and crossbones design. If you were a pirate, you had to have a Jolly Roger. It was the classic pirate symbol hoisted up on the flagpole to strike fear into the hearts of your enemies. You might think stealth was a better idea for pirates, but the Jolly Roger did serve a purpose. When passing ships saw the pirate symbol, they would often surrender without a fight. There were even different kinds of pirate flags to let passing ships know what they were 
dealing with. For example, the 18th century flag at the National Museum of the Royal Navy in England has a red background. The red color would have meant that the pirates would give no quarter in battle. In other words, they would slaughter everyone if they put up a fight. The flag made it to the museum thanks to Pamela Curry, a descendant of one Lieutenant Richard Curry. The lieutenant was the man who captured the pirate flag after an epic battle off the north coast of Africa in 1780. He kept the flag as a trophy, then it was passed down through his family. Before moving on, here's a bit of trivia you can impress your friends with. The Jolly Roger comes from the French phrase Jolly Rouge, which means pretty red. The skull and crossbones represented death. It was first used in the 1700s and grew hugely popular. Pirates would use the skull or even an entire skeleton with a different colored background to show how dangerous they were. St. Catherine's Head At the Basilica San Domenico in Siena is the mummified head of St. Catherine of Siena. Within the medieval basilica is also her right thumb stashed in a small reliquary. Catherine had her first vision when she was only seven years old. It was one of many visions that would help Catherine on her way to sainthood. She claimed she saw Jesus sitting on a throne, surrounded by saints. She refused to be married, instead keeping her virginity and cutting her hair off. She would burn herself to ward away potential suitors. When she was old enough, Catherine became a nun. Later on in life, she had a vision of Jesus Christ placing a wedding band on her finger. This was no ordinary ring. In Catherine's vision, the ring was made from baby Jesus's foreskin. What would you think about a potential partner proposing to you with a ring made of such a material? It was surely more acceptable 600 years ago. When Catherine was 28 years old, she received the stigmata. She was praying to a crucifix when rays of red shot from the artifact and pierced her hands, feet, and heart. She was later seen levitating. Once the Holy Communion flew from a priest's hands and into Catherine's mouth like a frisbee. To be fair though, nobody knows how much truth there is in Catherine's legends. At the age of 33, in the year 1380, Catherine died. She was in Rome, but her hometown of Siena wanted her body. Since they couldn't smuggle her whole body past the Roman guards, they took her head and stashed it in a paper bag. It's been at the church ever since. The Bloodstained Tunic In 2014, an artifact of unspeakable horror was pulled from an auction in Canada. It was a truly gruesome artifact, a relic of genocide splattered with the blood of a murdered child. This is a pretty heavy one, so strap yourself in. The artifact was a tunic stained in blood. It was taken, presumably off the back, of a child who belonged to the Plains Indians in the late 19th century. The tunic was made of leather, beautifully trimmed in traditional native stylings. It had colorful beads work and the sleeves were fringed. By itself, the tunic was an exceptional piece of late Native American work. The issue was that it had clearly been taken from a slain youngster. It was a stark piece of evidence of the Indian Wars and the Canadian government's extermination policies in the late 1800s. In the middle of the tunic was a bullet hole. The bullet hole showed that whoever wore the tunic was shot in the chest and a bullet came out their back. The back of the piece of clothing was covered in obvious blood stains from the exit wound. It's unclear what the whole story is behind it, though you can draw your own conclusions from the evidence. At first, the tunic was going to be sold at an auction in Toronto as decorative art. It was only removed from the catalogue when the public had a meltdown. People were outraged that something so obviously terrible was being sold as a decoration. Imagine putting such a thing on your wall to show off to your guests. How would you feel if you saw this kind of artifact displayed in a friend's home? The World of Witchcraft In 2018, England's Ashmolean Museum put on an incredibly unusual expedition. It was called Spellbound, Magic Ritual and Witchcraft. 180 objects dating as far back as the 12th century were put on display to freak everybody out. Some of the artifacts were beyond explanation. Not all of them had a detailed history history, but they were all exceedingly weird. Take for example a silvered glass flask supposedly containing the spirit of a witch. A handwritten label on the glass shows it was made in 1850. However, there were no details about the witch in the bottle or how she was trapped in the first place. The exhibition also had a Chinese wax figurine pierced with pins, a toad's heart stuck with thorns, and a real human heart jammed into a heart-shaped locket dated to Ireland in the 19th century. One of the strangest artifacts facts was a witch's garland, a magical charm made in Italy in the 19th century. Superstition and belief in magic have always been a part of Tuscan traditions. The witch's
his garland was made of feathers and bones, woven just like an ordinary flower garland. Only this one was concealed underneath someone's mattress to curse them to die. The Giantess's Bones A very disturbing skeleton was discovered in a Polish cemetery that seems to suggest giants once roamed medieval Europe. The shocking discovery was made outside a medieval church by archaeologists from a local museum near the Ostrov Lednitsky stronghold. They dug up the bones of a woman who stood an unimaginable 7 foot 2 inches. The Giantess would have towered above even the tallest living men today, but seeing as she lived in the Middle Ages, she would have really towered above well, everyone. Men in medieval Europe hardly grew more than five and a half feet. She would have been nearly two feet taller than her male peers. Unfortunately, she wasn't a giant in the sense that she belonged to a race of enormous people time has forgotten. Rather, she was afflicted by a horrible disease. The nameless woman may have reached great heights, but she didn't live very long. She suffered from gigantism, a malfunction in the pituitary gland causing growth hormones to be produced more than they're supposed to be. This is what caused causes people to grow over seven feet tall. She also suffered from something called acromegaly, which causes the bones in the head to become larger. She had gigantism of the body and gigantism of the skull. Someone you might recognize who suffered from both these conditions would be Andre the Giant. He had both gigantism and acromegaly. The medieval Polish woman was not the tallest woman ever, though. In the 19th century, Canadian Anna Swan grew to be almost eight feet tall. Anna married Martin Van Buren Bates, aka the Kentucky Giant. Their second child was 23 pounds at birth and only lived for 11 hours. Gigantism is not something that can be passed down without major consequences. We won't be seeing people with gigantism breeding giant-sized kids anytime soon. Blackbeard's Disturbing Implements Queen Anne's Revenge was notorious pirate Blackbeard's flagship. The sunken vessel is currently submerged off the coast of North Carolina, where it sank in 1718. It was first found in 1996, and archaeologists have been studying it ever since. Some of the most disturbing things they found in in the wreckage are horrible medical devices that will make your skin crawl. Blackbeard, real name Edward Teach, is the epitome of piracy. He was the darkest and most fearsome figure who ever terrorized the Seven Seas. But what a lot of people don't know is that Blackbeard wasn't active for very long. First, he was a privateer serving in Queen Anne's War of 1701 to 1714. He turned to piracy immediately after the war and was killed in November 1718. He was hardly active for a full four years. Years. Blackbeard's end came when Virginia Governor Alexander Spotswood sent a crew of naval vessels to defeat the pirates in combat near Ocracoke Island. In the watery grave of Blackbeard's greatest ship, Archaeologists recovered a horde of brutal medical implements. These things would be considered atrocities by modern medical standards, but in the 18th century, they were lifesavers to pirates. Most of the medical implements I'm talking about are metal urethral syringes. Yeah, it's just as gross as it sounds. The syringes were used to inject pure mercury into a pirate's you-know-what to help treat syphilis. This was how naughty pirates, and indeed all the naughty people of the 18th century, treated their STDs before the discovery of penicillin. Human Skin Jackets For a mere $720, you can get yourself a human skin jacket, not even a thousand bucks for a literal second skin. Of course, the creepy jackets are not made of real human flesh. The disturbing coats are made by an online seller known only as the Flesh Crafter. The seller hasn't given their real name for fairly obvious reasons. They most likely don't want their friends knowing they spend their spare time fashioning outfits from fake human flesh. The process of making such a ghastly artifact is a little strange. First, you need to send a creator a jacket that fits you, then they cover it over in a replica of human skin and it's delivered to your front door. They basically cover a jacket you already own in the fake skin. If you've ever wanted to know what it feels like to be Buffalo Bill or Ed Gein, this is the right outfit for you. Would you wear one? Let me know in the comments. Be sure to subscribe and we'll see you in the next one.